Good morning, folks. Welcome. Uh, it's a challenge to follow a talk by Linda Rising because she's always inspirational. Uh, you probably saw me get up and tell you a little bit about the, the, the day earlier on, but for those that haven't met me, my name is Shane Hasty. I'm the Director of Agile Learning Programs for the International Consortium for Agile. And business agility is something that is really important for us at IC Agile, but also uh, an area of passion for me personally. I've seen Agile work, Agile development practices, Agile philosophies, Agile approaches in information technology organizations and information te technology departments within organizations. But what we're seeing today is the need to take these ideas, the concepts of agility, Agile with a small a, that ability to change quickly and to respond and bring them into other parts of the business, to other areas of the organization. But there are some fundamental things that need to be in place to enable that to happen. And that's what, what, what I'm going to talk about here are the foundations. I got this badge a number of years ago at a conference. Agile is not a noun. Agile is not a thing. Agile is something that changes something else. Agile development, agile analysis, agile business. That flexibility, adaptability, constantly able to change. And I'm going to look at this from the point of view of a start with why, Simon Sinek. Go right to the Bible and start with why is this important. And then I want to deal with some of the what's, but the what's that happen at an organizational level and the what's that happen at an individual level. Because change starts with you not with the organization. So, the nimbleness of a company, the ability to quickly adapt while empowering everyone associated with the brand. Now, that was Steve's definition. The ability of an organization to renew itself, to adapt, to change quickly and really important to succeed while they do so in this rapidly changing, turbulent, ambigu ambiguous business environment. And that is the nature of our business environment today. This model, the, 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 the nine domains of business agility with the customer right in the middle, that comes from work that Evan, who was the, the business geek in the three-piece suit, who was there with me when we were doing the introductions, and he and I and uh, Henrik were, were the track designers. And we, we looked at these nine domains, these nine areas, as things that matter, but really, really important. And this is one of the hardest changes for many organizations, is changing the focus and putting the customer at the center of everything. So the why. Why does this stuff matter? How many of you have seen this acronym before? VUCA. It's, it's a, a buzzword almost. It's been around for a few years. Actually came out of the US military talking about the state that they found the world in. And it's about the volatility, the rate of change. The, the rate of change is faster today than it ever has been before, and tomorrow it will be even faster. It is accelerating at a truly exponential rate. This drives uncertainty. We have no idea what the outcomes are going to be, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Linda mentioned U.S. politics. I happen to be in 
the United States in 2016, November. I was at a conference in California. Now, I live in New Zealand, so it, it didn't directly impact me. But we were there, the conference was there over the election period. And on the, the morning after the election, everybody in that conference in California was in shock. It was a physical thing. They were in a state of disbelief that this could have happened. The complexity in our world and in our organizations, there is no simple path anymore. There are no obvious problems. If we think of the, of the, of the complexity models, we live in a realm where most of the challenges that we face are in that complex environment, which is why the trial, the experimentation approach that Linda was talking about this morning, the probe sense respond is so very important because we don't have a nice sequence. Doing root cause analysis actually is really, really hard in most of the challenges, most of the opportunities that we find ourselves in our organizations today. And Ambiguity is a constant state. The lack of meaning, the lack of clarity. What is this? What is the implication of what is ha happening to us? A rapidly evolving, dynamic, chaotic, complex business environment is the norm rather than the exception. So, is this true? How many of your organizations are dealing in this world of VUCA as the norm today? Is there any, anyone who's not? Yeah, sadly. So that means we have to change our ways of thinking. Because our management structures, our organizational dynamics, the, the way that our organizations have been built generally is not supportive of business agility. Because these organizations were, were chartered, were founded, were structured using models that worked well in the 19th and 20th century predictive, mechanistic workplace. Where the primary source of value was leveraging human labor. Today, the primary source of value is lever leveraging human knowledge. And that means we absolutely have to change everything about our organizations if we are going to actually survive. We have to become fundamentally responsive, adaptive, Agile, in the tr truest sense of the term. And we have to build it right down into the core. It's not something that we lay over the top. Ahmed Sidki uses the, um, an analogy that is beautiful when he talks about a transformation that organizations go through to become agile. It, it goes right into the DNA. Uh, he talks about adopting agile practices as a bowl of strawberries. And we see this in many organizations. We bring in these, the, these new practices. We maybe adopt Scrum. Uh, we, we, we might be doing it in marketing or, or in uh, HR or let's call it even uh, people operations, please, because human beings are not resources. Uh, or we're doing it in IT. And we've got these, uh, these small groups that are doing quite well. They're adopting the agile practices. They may be even getting some of the agile mindset. And then we spread and we, we bring in a bit more and more and more teams. And if we talk to management, they're happy because you are becoming agile. But the fundamental DNA of the organization isn't changing. A true transformation happens when we take those bowls of strawberries, we put them into a pot, we add sugar, and we put them under heat and pressure, and we make jam. 
Strawberry jam is a completely different thing to 25 bowls of strawberries. And by the way, you can't go backwards. You can't reverse engineer the strawberries from the strawberry jam. Take the sugar out. It doesn't work. And this is a commitment to change that is that significant in our organization. So it's not putting a veneer of agility. It's fundamentally changing the way we think. The, the, the core, the, the true DNA. So what are some of the changes we need? Well, Computer Associates used to be Rally Software. They study these things. And they've gone out and done, a, done research. And they're finding that um, the project management office, strangely enough, in many organizations, has figured out that their current way of doing work doesn't work really well. That we can't predict many projects. Today. That we've got to adopt different philosophies and the evolving into an agile way of working. So PMOs are getting it. But now, you know, that, that's, that's one small area. In this exploration, in this study, they, they looked at what's happening beyond the PMO and they, you know, other departments, other areas of the business that need to change. So if we've adopted an agile delivery mechanism for, for product delivery. And your teams are doing really well and they're, they're able to deploy products every two weeks if we're using Scrum and we're, we're deploying at the end of every sprint. Or more, more frequently if we're using a continuous delivery model. But your marketing department has a six month planning cycle and books advertising space nine to twelve months in advance, then We've got a fundamental disconnect. If the human, res uh, human resource policies treat people like resources, where we stack rank people, and we, we compare them against one another, oh, and then we tell them work in a highly collaborative cross-functional team and help each other be successful. But your bonus is not dependent on being a team member. Your bonus is dependent on doing better than the other people in the team. But there's something fundamentally broken. And we have to change not just the product delivery, not just the R&D, not just the IT, not even not just the marketing, the HR, but we've got to change everything in the organization in order to bring this new way of thinking. We've got to adjust our management policies from the top-down command and control to leadership at every level, where we empower people to be leaders, to take ownership. There's a, a hotel chain in, in North America, a fairly exclusive hotel chain, and they have a policy. If any person in the organization, anyone in the hotel, comes across a guest who is in any way unhappy, that person is empowered to spend two and a half thousand dollars immediately to solve that guest problem. There is no getting permission, going to a manager, filling in three forms. It's that guest is unhappy. This is a customer who we care about. Fix their problem immediately. Oh, and by the way, do tell us what you did afterward. Now go, there, there, there is a form to fill in that says, I, I used the company credit card, spent $2,300, and I hired a limousine to take this person to where they wanted to go. Well, that's fine. There is a, you know, be a good corporate citizen, be responsible. And that's the, that's the key thing. We're empowering people at the edge, the people who are closest to the customer, the people who are closest, who know why, where the real challenges are to be responsive, to be adaptive. 
to take leadership, to take ownership. How many of you heard, been told, now, do more with less? We want this efficiency focus. It's nonsense. Just do less. We know from the Pareto principle, 80% of value comes from 20% of the features in any product that you have. We know from studies in, in the information technology realm that look at the usage of the, the features that we build into our products. 68%, according to one study, study, 68% of the features that we build into these pro software products are never used. Not used occasionally, not used by one person in a thousand. Built because somebody had a requirement that never, ever. There is nothing worse than doing well that which should not be done at all. Edward Denny. How do we minimize the process? It's not about getting rid of process. What's the minimum viable process? Business rules with empowered people. Linda mentioned Menlo Innovations. They have a, a hiring policy that when they're looking for people, their single most important factor criteria is not your technical skill. In fact, they don't look at your technical skills. They don't even look at your CV when they decide to hire. If you want to come along and be a programmer, they don't even check to see that you can write code. Before they will even talk to you, they're looking to see, do you have what they call kindergarten skills? Do you play well with others? Because they've figured out that the technical skills in their environment, they can teach you really, really quickly. Because they work in a, in a pairing basis. So if you've got the basics of, of programming skills, for instance, but you have never programmed in the language that the, this product is being built in, well, you're going to be paired up with somebody who does. And within a day or so, you will be picking up the language, provided you've got the kindergarten skills. Empower people, minimum process. We've got a keynote by Beata Borges later today, looking at the, the whole beyond budgeting movement and why this matters. Get away from the annual planning cycle, which is typically 18 months to two years ahead. We're trying to predict what we're able to achieve. It doesn't. So what do we do? We produce piles of paper with lies embedded in them. And everyone knows it's a lie, but it feels good. Change and look at what are the real-time value metrics. Not vanity metrics, value metrics. Return on investment, customer value delivered, customer engagement, stakeholder, employee engagement, outcomes-driven metrics, the things that are hard to measure and that are often very embarrassing over the really simple things to measure. Velocity. How many of you use velocity as a measure of uh, delivery of something in your IT program? What does velocity tell you? It might tell you that you've been busy. How many times have somebody come to you and said, we need to increase our velocity? Really simple way to increase velocity, double the number of stories in the story. Bang! I've just doubled by, increased my velocity by 100%. I have done nothing different. The planning that is based around these, these one, two, three, even six, nine year project. Think it back. Adapt, respond. And a lot of this is about changing the way our organization is structured. Yuka's going to talk about 
how we have to do that. Next. So it's kind of embarrassing to sit in, to, to do a talk like this with somebody like Steve and, and in the room because you know, you're talking to the people who've written the books about the books they've written. But Steve talks about the, these three laws, the law of the small team moving away from bureaucracies and hierarchies into small cross-functional outcome-focused teams. Putting the customer at the center, the law of, of the customer. Customer delight is the single most important metric for your organization. It's the purpose that your organization exists for. And moving away from, again, bureaucratic structures to networks where teams can, teams of teams can collaborate. So these are big shifts that organizations have. To do that, we've got to change a lot about the way we think. We start with one of the most important characteristics, psychological safety. This is the output of Google's Project Aristotle, where they look to see what makes a successful team in the Google environment. Now, Google is a metrics-driven organization. They measure everything. And they automate the measuring. So they really, really can get down to the numbers. And they thought, going in, the premise, the assumption of this research was that technical skills are probably going to be the most important factor for successful teams. And they were shocked to discover that that was wrong. By examining the outcomes, results achieved by the different teams, and then with the psychologists, exactly what was going on. They found there were these five factors that actually make a difference in the outcomes the teams achieve. The first one, has a bigger, bigger impact than all of the other four put together. This is the concept of psychological safety. In the team environment, I am safe. My colleagues have got my back, is how it was expressed most frequently. I can take a risk if I make a mistake. I'm not going to be attacked and belittled. I'm going to be supported. I'm going to be cared about by my colleagues, by my friends. That single factor was the biggest contributor. And they were able to measure the numeric, the monetary impact of this. They looked, uh, one group that they looked at were the sales teams. And they found in the sales teams, where psychological fact, uh, safety was in place, those teams that had, had psychological safety in place were consistently performing at about 21% above the norm. So they had the norm, they had the average. These teams were consistently at the 21% above it. On the other hand, teams that did not have psychological safety in place were consistently performing performing at 19% below the average. So the difference between a psychologically safe and an unsafe environment is a 40% performance outcome in real money terms in the sales teams. They are now actively working with their, in their organization to figure out how do we make things safe? How do we create this environment of safety? Because that's going to push everybody and lift the averages. Better teams make better money. What a weird. In order to allow these changes to happen within our organizations, we absolutely must make space for learning. The need to learn 
unlearn and relearn constantly. Things are changing. Those that will thrive are the ones that can create, embrace, generate new ideas constantly and discard the old. It's not, again, about doing more with less. It's stopping doing what doesn't work. It's taking the, the lens of waste and saying, where is the value here? Stop doing it. What could we do differently? And that means creating space, time, to explore and to learn. Again, we've all heard of Google's 20% time. It may or may or may not always be applied. But that, that capacity to step back from the work that you are doing and think about the bigger the system that you work in and just being given permission to relax and think about work rather than constantly focus on you. And the concept of aligned autonomy in the value of empowering people to make good decisions and management's responsibility is to set goals and outcomes but trust that we employ highly skilled technical people who know what they are doing. That's why we employed them. And then we trust them to figure out the best way to achieve the outcome. Dan Pink talks about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. The autonomy factor. Provide clear goals to allow people to figure out the best way of doing it. And when you've got these highly creative, cross-functional, collaborative teams, they will amaze you with the outcomes that they achieve, with the, the creative ideas. Because we've also started to figure out that all of us are smarter than any one of us. And in that, that safe environment, we can actually truly achieve. But I, I touched on vanity metrics earlier. We need to stop measuring the wrong things. And we need to change what we look at. What are the metrics? What are the outcomes? that matter. It's not how busy you are. It's not how many story points you delivered. It's how many customers purchased the product because of this new feature. It's how delighted were your customers. It's how engaged are your people. It's what's the quality of the product. What is the value you are delivering? How rapidly are we learning and changing as an organization? Metrics kill us. And this is an example of a metric that literally killed an organization. This is an airline that I used to do a lot of business with a number of years ago. We sold, I had a company and we sold airline back office administrative systems. One of the things that airlines do and have as a target is uh, on-time performance. It really matters. Because you actually pay fine. You get penalized if you don't depart on time from an airport because those slots are quite expensive. So they had a, a penalty measure, a metric in the, in the organization where the engineers were told, you know, you've got exactly this much time to service the plane and it's got to be back and ready to go. Well, the plane went in for an, a regular service, one that was scheduled, and you know they had this block of time. Or they were getting close to the end of the block of time, so the engineering manager was walking around, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, work harder, work harder, we've got to get it out. So they got it out. Got it to the, uh, to the departure gate, they loaded it full of passengers, and they went to take off, and to the way around, down the runway, um, that thing that's the, the hole there, there used to be an engine. It fell off. And when they did the root cause analysis, it turned out that you know, the engineer had put one in every five volts in because he was being shot. 
Unfortunately, the plane hadn't actually left the ground. The airline closed down and never opened again. But they did need the on time departure. So they were away from the gate. And I'm not going to talk much about the on budgeting except to say, come to the keynote this afternoon. How do we make this visible? So part of this culture change is openness and transparency. And th this comes from an organization in New Zealand, where, where I'm from, Kiwi Bank. Uh, these are the walls in a room they call the, the sorting room. It's up on the top floor of the, uh, of the head office building. It's a small conference room. And they have a table. There's, there's no, uh, there are tall, tall stools, tall, tall, tall table. And once a week, the executive team get together and they talk about what's happening in the organization. Every one of these post-its represents an initiative that is underway. And they look at it in terms of time frames and, and so forth. Now, they've got a couple of key protocols. One of them, this one is open to anybody in the organization at any time. If you want to know what's the big picture, come up to the 12th floor and have a look. And anyone from the lowliest postman to the chief executive can and do come in there and see, okay, what? The work that I am doing, where does it sit on these initiatives? And every single person in that organization can trace the work that they are doing on a daily basis back to something that's on this wall. They're also empowered to say, you know what, the work that I'm doing doesn't contribute to something here. Why not? Why am I doing it? And if it doesn't, they can stop doing it. The other thing that they have, and this is part of their, their social protocol as a group, is see on the that there, that is a picture of an elephant. It's on the back of the door. And if during the conversations they discover that somebody feels there is a topic that is not being addressed. the elephant in the room. Their protocol is write it on a post-it note, stick it on the door. We will not leave until we've tackled the elephant problem. And that's a commitment that they make to each other. And it, again, it makes it safe to have those hard conversations. And, they, and, in, and amongst this team, they have that psychological safety that it's okay. And that pervades through the whole organization. In our organizations today, this plan, do, check, act cycle has been written about since about 1935, was it, Steve? I think the Sherman cycle was around about the 1930s. Plan, do, check, act, OODA loops. What we find in our organizations is we're really good plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do. We suck at check, act. We don't change direction. We plan, do. And we will continue that plan, um, hell or high water. Because success has somehow been defined as, you know, plan the work and then work the plan. And any deviation from that is failure. Where the reality in today's environment is that the plan to do cycle, is part of the size of the should be really small, because we check and then we plan to do it again. And changing our planning approach to constantly learning, adapting, responding. And remove waste. This is part of my do less. They never do more with less, but just fundamentally look for ways to do less. Don't build things that people don't want. Share knowledge. There, was, there is the, the old adage that knowledge is power. And in siloed organizations, that's true. In collaborative organizations, the sharing of knowledge is powerful. Remove the handoffs. Again, the concept of a cross-functional collaborative team and cross-functional individuals. Get rid of delays. 
Stop task switching. Focus on one thing. Build quality in. Don't try and test quality in places. And from the, the part, partially done work, finish what you start. Don't task switch. Easy to say. Reasonably hard to do in those organizations. So we have to rethink. We've got to find ways to respond with the speed of change, listen to the voice of the customer, empower our people, align them, stop treating people as resources to be consumed in the production of a product, or assets to be sold, slavery was abolished. People are the primary source of value and innovation. Here Maria's talk is fundamentally about how to approach and change the, the people people in our organization. Focus on the outputs, uh, on the outcomes, not the outputs. Focus on value instead of busy. Think of innovation as a, as a core competency. And yeah, stop trying to predict the fundamentally unpredictable concept. Move away from Estimation as a, a constraint, as estimation as a learning factor. And for the vast majority of knowledge organizations, projects don't make sense. Now there, I'm going to do an advert and place commercial here. Evan and I are very, very close to finishing our book on a project. But this is about genuine change. It's not putting the veneer of agile of your organization. It's not doing an LED stand-up, which is micromanagement from heaven. Where the manager wants to know what the last four hours at least justify every minute that you see. These are fundamental and hard changes. But they don't just have at the organizational level, they have to happen at the individual level. Because organizations are made up of people. You are the organization. It's not an abstract thing. So it starts with changing yourself. It's examining, it's holding up a mirror. And these, are, these can be uncomfortable conversations. Looking at your, your mindset, lovely term, we hear it all the time, agile is a mindset, what is a mindset? Your established set of attitudes and habits. When you are faced with uncertainty, how do you respond? Is it with fear and narrowing your focus? Or is it with excitement? Wow, there's something new I can learn here. If it's fear, what happens? Cortisol, get, cortisol gets released and we narrow our focus. And we don't come up with creative opportunities, creative solutions. We revert to the habits. In our organizational case, it's reverting back to that command control style of action. What we want to do is free and be able to see uncertainty as exciting. At an individual level, the responsibility is on you to constantly learn, to be a lifelong learner. You're here at this conference. That's an indication that you're learning and that you want to learn. I hope it is anyway. It's not just a matter of your boss holding the cup. You're genuinely open to learning things. It's a lifelong commitment. At the end of every day, do you ask yourself, what did I learn today that I didn't know yesterday? What assumption that I had yesterday have I invalidated today? If the answer is nothing, please be disappointed in yourself. 
become passionately dissatisfied. The status quo is wrong. The way we did things yesterday is probably not the way we should do them tomorrow. When you get the do more with less, stop. Actually, just think about where's the list. What can I stop doing? What can I do that is new and different? Take ownership. Take responsibility for your own growth. Hold yourself and hold your colleagues accountable. So ask that question in the Daily Standard. What did you learn yesterday? Share that knowledge. Who is your customer? And it's not the manager who signed the project approval. There is somebody whose life is changing because of the work that you do. What do you know about that person? How much do you care about that person's needs? If you don't know who that person is, if you haven't met that person, go and find them. Have a conversation with them. Find out how their lives are changed by the work that you do. And then become fanatical about improving them. Everything is a trial. Everything is an experiment. Open up to learning. Linda's talk this morning was beautiful in that it really is this concept of the hypothesis that we're trying to test. The trial we want to do, the learning that we want to achieve. And yet maybe it's not safe to talk about failure in your organization. I hope it becomes such. Because that's the honesty. Like the entrepreneur. What is that trial? What is that experiment? And the responsibility is on nobody but you. You can do it, you can choose to do it, you can choose to ignore it. It's not the senior executive empowering you. It's you making the decision. Yes, I can change. And that change cascades across the whole organization. If we can achieve it, we can turn VUCA into something really inspiring and positive. Vision. The intent to create an exciting and compelling future. Understanding, learning, hearing, feedback. Clarity, making sense in this complex world. And an agility responding to change in order to profit it in the environment. So that that rapidly evolving, dynamic, chaotic, complex business environment is actually a source of advantage. Rather than uh, have you got a mic? We've got about five minutes. Be patient and well, 
first of all, you want to use that, that experimentation learning approach and find the quick wins, find the small outcomes, the things that are, that are, that are getting better. So you want to, you want to identify the outcomes and the metrics that, that are going to matter. So maybe it's, uh, it's customer engagement or it is profitability or quality of the product or employee engagement. So what are the, the, the metrics that matter the things that are, are hurting at the moment. And then do the small experiment to see, well, we believe that if I do this, that's going to improve. Does it improve? Yes, it does. Okay, so now I can report, we tried this, it improved that factor. What would we do next to improve that factor a little bit more? So, and, and if it didn't work, well, that's great, because you've made the, the trial frugal, using Linda's advice from this morning, so that the cost, the investment required in, in doing that experiment, doing that trial, is low. So it's, it's the constant feedback to leadership and management to the various areas of the organization saying, this is what we're achieving through this process. So it's not a matter of they're waiting years to see outcomes, they're starting to see outcomes, and frequently we're starting to see outcomes within weeks of bringing in some of these people. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, we need to change these structures in the organization. But, uh, even if we change this structure, first of all, it takes a lot of time to change these structures. If you go to new structures, they will again add up into new structures. So one of the things which I have found useful in my work is uh, virtual teams are forming, forming and dissolving. So if you can treat and use them as self-organizing cross-functional teams, agile teams, and really take the benefit of that, it helps to go across the silos without taking down the space. Yep. So the uh, one pattern from software engineering is the concept of the strangler pattern. One small piece at a time, replace one aspect, one area, make that change, then do the shift, then the next, and the next, and the next. So, yeah, incremental change. Now, you have a different view on that, but we'll hear about that. With, with sociocracy. But sometimes in organizations, it actually takes somebody to have the courage to do a radical change. And sometimes happens. It's sometimes an approach. Of course, the right answer is it depends. Which is. Uh, I have a question about uh, the engagement with the customers. Mm -hmm. What is the way we deliver value to them in terms of the outcome based value? Uh, the payment models, if you look at today the contracts, that when I say contract, it's not necessarily the legal contract, but the way of payment models that ex exist with customers, they're milestone based. But when you talk about business agility, uh, if I do a traditional approach, maybe there are three or four milestones and payments happen. Now, with the business agility coming into picture with the engineering delivering in more frequent cycles, what should be the model there? Is there any... Uh, I'm going to do an it depends again, but you, there are model, contracting models that support progressive commitment engagements. Um, Daniela Be Benefield has, has written a book called Flexible Contracts where she actually uh, looks at different legal aspects of different contracting models that support different ways of engaging with, with customers in that contract structure. But the, the fundamental idea is progressive commitment, um, yeah, thin slice delivery, uh, uh, coupled with either milestone-based or thin slice payments. But it, again, it's a shift. Thank you. Okay, I think we are out of time, so last thank you very much, folks. Last question. Shame, last question, if you may. Yep. <laughs> thank you, first of all, for this amazing session. Uh, so my question is, uh, on one of the slides you mentioned about changed imperatives, uh, wherein it talks about long-lived teams. Mm. Now, as we know, in, in, in the agile world, we talk about having virtual teams and teams which come together 
to work on a particular project or basically on developing certain services. Mm -hmm. And these are teams which are there for a particular period of time. Now, when we talk about having long-lived teams over virtual mm -hmm. teams, how do we, you know, how are we talking about so, being agile? Exactly. Here I am going to do an advert. Read our book when it comes out because our fundamental message is the project structure is broken. Okay. That what we build in knowledge worker organizations is products. And products are fundamentally long-lived. So if we have a group that builds a product and they pass that over to another group to look after it, there is no care about the quality of the product. That's one of the key things. So it becomes a phase two, it becomes the, the other group's responsibility, whereas if you have long-lived product teams, they are responsible for both building, maintaining, supporting that product. So it's basically project versus a product. Project versus product, and as a general rule today in knowledge worker environments, projects are a bad idea. 